So, uh, okay, about Duxtel. So those of you who don't know about Duxtel, um, we've been uh, working uh, with Microchip for a product for quite some time. Uh, we've been uh, selling them since around 2007. Uh, we're background is uh, data network consulting, so we do more than just uh, sell the product. Uh, we can uh, help with your pre-sales, we can help with your after-sales, we can help with your management, configuration, uh, designs. Uh, we can, uh, we have our uh, on-staff uh, help desk, so you can call us and talk to people about your problems. Uh, we have an engineering team, so that we can uh, offer some consulting services as well. Um, it, we also have a uh, software platform uh, that uh, some of uh, our software friends are here um, that uh, operate uh, ISPs, wireless ISPs, public network access, uh, anywhere where you have an end user accessing internet, we can uh, we can do that. Uh, and uh, <coughs> which is, I guess, uh, where our introduction to microchip came from, uh, in that before I was introduced by. Uh, to router OS platform, I used a variety of other things, and when I saw this one, I thought, where have you been on my router? <laughs> it has everything that we ever need. Uh, so yes, so Duxtel, our byline sometimes is just everything microchip. Think microchip, think Duxtel. Uh, even when it comes to the big ends, over time, uh, router boards, since they came out in the early days, have just been getting bigger and bigger and faster and faster and better. Uh, but bigger is not always better, and so what I thought I would do today is have a talk about some of the small ones. Some of these tiny little microchip products uh, that are so small they will even fit in your pocket. So I'm carrying all my demo gear here today in my pockets, and uh, I don't even bulge that much. <coughs> and three that I'll be focusing on today, uh, these three. duplicating the display so I could use the mouse on this. Uh, so uh, what have we got um, from the biggest small guy to the smallest small guy? Uh, bottom, the uh, MAP 2M. Uh, top right, uh, MAP Lite. And top left is the Woobum. Best thing about Woobum, I think, is the name. Start with the MAP 2ND. Here it is. Small, isn't it? It's tiny for a full-featured router OS device. Anything you can do on a CCR, you can do on this. Until your CPU runs out. <coughs> Some of the uh, cool features about it uh, is that it has uh, two Ethernet ports and they can be daisy chained, so it's like a PoE pass-through. Uh, PoE in, if you power the thing with uh, PoE, then whatever connects to the other one can also be powered by PoE. 100 meg Ethernet, it's uh, got a micro USB for uh, 3G fileovers if you want, or storage, or other things, uh, such as Woobum, which we'll see. It also has a full size uh, power port. Um, so for this uh, uh, 24 volt barrel connector, will go straight in without any adapters, which makes it really cool. Uh, and uh, a couple of things that I get to use these for often uh, is this one, for example. Uh, if uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people like me who built their houses in the uh, early 90s and um, thought, uh, why would you need an Ethernet socket next to uh, every, or in every room of the house, for example? Uh, and so why would I ever need to, uh, to have a VoIP phone that I use for intercom so that uh, I can uh, uh, tell the kids to come to dinner? without having to go up the stairs, for example. Uh, and of course, I never thought that would happen. Uh, and here I am with a voice phone that I need to connect somehow. I can either buy a, uh, a, a Wi-Fi voice phone, or I can just get a standard one off the shelf, uh, plug the uh, MAP in, make it a client, because of course it's router OS, it can uh, be a, a wireless client that is bridged to e internet, uh, Ethernet. Uh, then I can plug into the PoE out port, uh, plug it into the phone, the phone's powered, the uh, client Wi-Fi is powered, the thing connects to our homeland, <coughs> it's on the voice network straight away. Uh, only one power supply, minimum cables, don't need to run them through the house and so forth. <coughs> um, can you use 
just uh, because we don't uh, hear uh, oh, on the camera. Okay, so you can okay. explain that he's there. Hello, everybody out there in the internet land. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no worries, Paul. So I didn't understand that one before. <coughs> okay, so the uh, key feature of the pass through POE. What that means is that if you have an access point out in the wild somewhere that has a uh, that is powered by PoE, such as this uh, Microtik Groove, uh, that might be part of a uh, public access hotspot network, let's say, and uh, let's say that we want to put a second device uh, on the pole, uh, all we have to do is uh, take the cable out of the groove, uh, plug it into this one, and then plug this into the groove, and then all of a sudden you have two. Uh, Wi-Fi devices, two wireless devices uh, powered from the single thing. I don't have to run any extra power cables. I don't have to provision any more power points. Uh, I can just uh, fire it up straight away. Uh, and this uh, brings me to uh, my first uh, example of uh, an interesting project I thought you might like, uh, of uh, a good way to use these things. I'm plugged into the right one. P-O-E in. So <coughs> this is a project that, uh, that we did with the city of Geelong uh, where we uh, uh, helped them operate a public Wi-Fi network in the city. Uh, and there's a lot of grooves and a lot of Omnitix and a lot of uh, um, other sort of hybrid devices made out of router boards and various antennas and so forth. And uh, this one here. <coughs> and uh, we decided that uh, we're going to uh, run a, uh, a bit of an experiment uh, using the uh, passive Wi-Fi snooper uh, uh, on this, where, uh, as you may be aware, you can detect MAC addresses of mobile phone devices and so forth as they go past. Uh, and so if you're... We we're looking at this one just uh, this week in the... Uh, MTC and A program. In fact, if you if you have a any wireless any Microtik device will have this uh, this uh, uh, function here. Oh. So I'm looking at the wind box on my screen here and uh, forgetting that you guys can't see it. I'm sure I uh, duplicated this display before. Good old PowerPoint. Um, Giannis, where's Giannis? I saw a mouse here before, I thought I might be able to use it. Hmm. Suddenly, uh, suddenly my trackpad doesn't work. Touchpad thing. Windows, hey? <laughs> I reckon I have far more problems with Windows than just about anything else. Uh, is it that one? Why is it that uh, Windows seems to think it knows better than I do when it comes to whether I want to extend the display or duplicate them? Good, good, good. Okay. <coughs> Back on track. Here's my win box. Uh, here's where I was before with my wireless interface and this is what I was pointing at before while I was talking to myself, it seems. Uh, snooper. Snooper. So I'm sure you all know that you can click on, uh, on scan and see the other access points. You can click on frequency usage and just see uh, the spectrum that's being used. Uh, you can click on... 
uh, snooper and see the clients as well. Sorry, that's the sniff, sniff that I want. I'm going to run the sniffer, and the sniffer sort of works for a little while. Uh, and what it does is it watches all of the packets on the network. And what I'm particularly interested in are ones called type of uh, probe request. And uh, if I leave it long enough, um, I actually detect uh, all of the wireless clients that are sitting in the pockets of people uh, doing things behind your back without telling you like, uh, is my home network here? Or uh, what networks are here? Uh, and in doing so, I can actually see those with this packet sniffer and I can record them. So no doubt if you uh, get your phone out, even though it's turned off as in a, a black screen like this, uh, chances are you'll see it on the list there, some of them several times. Does that make you feel a bit queasy or a bit uneasy? Um, uh, if it does, uh, you'll love this next bit because uh, what we can also do uh, is run a little script that uh, will script that will uh, run this snoop every now and then. Probably a bit small to see. Uh, but what it will do is it then iterates through the list. It picks out all the MAC addresses and then it posts them to a web server. And on the web server, essentially, it will collect some information. It will collect the MAC address. It will connect, collect the signal strength. Uh, and it'll collect, obviously, the time and day. And because we know the, uh, the it also posts the serial number of this particular device. Uh, and so in that database, we've got some location information. We've got potential triangulation information by the signal strength of more than one. Uh, and we can then log during the day how many people are visiting certain parts of the city. And uh, not only that, but what paths they take uh, through the city on any particular day. Really cool application. Uh, the a kind of, I don't have any live data to show you as far as what that really looks like. Um, oh, look at that, I haven't even got a sample. Mm. This is obviously not my latest revision of this review. I did have a map uh, showing the city of Geelong with a kind of a, uh, a heat map sort of traversal that shows the, the major paths that people are taking through the city. Just so that you don't stay away from Geelong because of this, we're not doing it at the moment. <laughs> so please still come to Geelong and visit the wonderful foreshore. The small end of town. This brings me to my second gadget that also fits in my pocket. This one is uh, so small I have to check the pockets to figure out which pocket it's in. Here it is, <coughs> the map light. So if you thought map was small, this one's even smaller. It'll fit in a top pocket. Uh, you can probably even carry it in your teeth for a short time as you go through passport control. Uh, it's uh, a POE in, as you can see, and uh, I'm using my uh, map to end to power it. And because that MAP2N being a, uh, a pass-through PoE passive sniffer for Wi-Fi networks, uh, it's also got the two Ethernet ports bridged, so they just pass straight through. <coughs> map Lite is also pretty cool. It's got uh, 802.11n, dual-chain Wi-Fi. Uh, it's full router OS, which of course is the greatest thing in the world, router OS. Uh, so it has all of the flexibility of any MicroTik router that you can think of. Uh, it uh, has access point and station uh, and does all the VPNs and so forth, which makes it a really handy uh, road warrior device. So I carry one of these everywhere I go, uh, and what I do with it is I have it set up so that when I plonk myself down somewhere, I plug it into my laptop, uh, it will automatically connect to the Wi-Fi that I happen to be at, whether it's... Uh, 
at, at a customer site, if it's at the Qantas Lounge, if it's uh, in the free Wi-Fi network in Geelong or one of the other networks we operate. Uh, the thing will automatically associate. Did you know you could do that? You know how you have remembered networks on phones and laptops? Did you know you can also remember networks on router OS? Not many people realise that, but in fact you can. I'll show you how to do that in a moment. When my uh, map light connects to, uh, so let's say, Qantas Lounge, for example, uh, once it has an internet connection, it will automatically dial a VPN to my office. And then over the VPN, I have an Ethernet over IP tunnel, and I have that tunnel because I can bridge it. What that means, I can bridge that tunnel to the office, and I can bridge this end to the Ethernet, which means when I plug my laptop in, it can connect, it get a DHCP client from the office network, uh, and it's on the broadcast domain of the office. It's exactly the same as if I was in the office, except for it's really shit bandwidth, of course. <laughs> Not only that, but because it's router OS, I can have virtual AP. So on the same single wireless, I can put an access point. I can bridge that access point onto the same bridged LAN that is connected to the office. And then my phones and my tablet and other devices and the kids' phones and the kids' tablets so they can print stuff to the office printer and waste paper. <laughs> <laughs> it happens sometimes. And my kids are in their 20s. So here's the, uh, a, a picture, I guess, of, of how all that works. I, I should have been switching the slides while I was talking, but uh, I neglected to do that. Do you think Windows has uh, changed my displays back to extended instead of duplicated? Yes. I think it has. Uh, you know, I kind of remember this happening before because I do recall a presentation where I kept having to go back to the display settings and change them all the time. Uh, and I think that's a recurring dream. I'll duplicate the displays. Yes, I want to keep the changes. Yes, I want to exit that again. Yes, I want to run a win box. But at least by now the uh, map light will have booted. Uh, so first up, uh, how to remember the networks. Uh, remembering networks is done with a feature in the wireless called Connect List. Oh, here it is, it's obviously I've prepared it earlier. So, so you'll see here a list of uh, either MAC addresses or of SSIDs, Qantas Lounge and the Horsham Wi-Fi, Qu Qantas Club, <laughs> yeah. I uh, don't know if you noticed, I didn't notice this until I had to actually build this list, uh, is that uh, not all the Qantas Lounges have the same SSID. Strange, but true. Uh, and uh, various different, different locations. Uh, I can also here, it's not shown in this list, but uh, each of these connect lists you can choose a particular security profile. So you can have different security profiles in each one. And then, of course, when you uh, come into range and if this uh, device finds the, uh, one of those uh, networks in range, it'll automatically connect to it. It will uh, dial its VPN. I use uh, SSTP uh, in this case. Uh, once the SSTP is up, I have an Ethernet over IP tunnel that is uh, anchored on either sides of that uh, SSTP. Uh, and then it's bridged to the LAN and bridged to the local. The ultimate road warrior device. Every home should have one. Brings me to the next one. That's the map line the small end of town, Woobham. Woobham. Uh, all it is, it looks like a, a USB memory stick or a, one a, or a Bluetooth or something like that. Uh, and it's kind of a similar sort of animal. Um, 
I've had to use this uh, like uh, conversion cable to uh, connect it up because the uh, uh, the map to end doesn't have a full size USB, but doesn't matter. So I plug it in there. Um, of course, uh, USB has power, and uh, map to end has a, a powered USB output, uh, and it boots up. Uh, and what, while that's booting up, I'll just describe what it's uh, supposed to do. Uh, essentially, it's like, I guess, a, a null modem cable, uh, but with wireless, with Wi-Fi. Uh, so it's designed so that you can get uh, access to the uh, shell of router OS uh, without having to plug any cables and uh, without having to uh, climb poles to, to get access to the thing and so forth. Uh, and it operates in, in two different modes. It operates in this mode, which I have at the moment, where it just connects to the USB port, uh, and then that will give me ability to get uh, access to the console of the device it's connected to. An alternative method... Did I tell you that uh, MAP2N has a magnetic back on it that sticks to Wubum? <coughs> Uh, the second mode is uh, that it has a access point, uh, sorry, a station capability. So you can either uh, operate this thing as an access point to connect your laptop and get access to the, the terminal, or it can be a station and it can connect to your uh, an access point or a, a Wi-Fi network on your uh, your office LAN or on uh, in a rack, for example, in a data centre or something like that. And when, when you do that, you can then access the console of every other router OS device that's on that broadcast network. Let's uh, take a look at uh, how that works. And uh, please uh, bear with me while I... Ah, oh, OK. So Windows hasn't decided I wanted to extend the display. It's learning. Who would have thought? <coughs> so what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to set up my Wi-Fi and I'm going to connect my wireless to the Wubum. Uh, I've uh, connected this one before. Uh, and I'm going to have to be really fast here. Some of you may know why I've got to be quick. Uh, while this is going, it's because once Windows connects, there's no internet connection over that Wi-Fi. So Windows is going to decide that it's not useful for anything and disconnect from it and try to connect to something else. So it is, oh, it's very helpful. Yeah, I love Windows. It's, uh, it's on my side. It's looking out for me. Uh, sorry, no, I don't want Winbox. I want a, a web browser. <coughs> now, um, the, there's a DHCP server inside the Wubum, uh, and it will give my Wi-Fi client a an address. Uh, by default, it's an address on 192.168.4. So I can access the Wubum on 4.1. It may have already disconnected me. Uh, during the week, uh, one of the uh, participants with in our training class told me the answer to this, but I haven't got to, got to turn it off yet. So we'll just be quick. Can't connect. No. I may have to uh, jump to the second style if it doesn't want to play. Um, so yes, uh, long story short, you can override this uh, this behaviour of Windows, uh, but I haven't done it on this PC yet. All right, I'm going to jump to the second style, which is where it becomes an access point. And when I log on to it, I can show you the uh, configuration interface which uh, demonstrates how this is possible. Uh, on my uh, map light, 
Uh, you'll recall I mentioned I had a, a virtual AP that pretends to be the office network. Um, so if I turn, I had it disabled so that um, that Wubum wouldn't take it. Uh, so when I turn it on, then Wubum is going to associate with that. There it is. I'll enable that, and uh, we should see it. Ah. Oh. All right, I do apologise. I'm going to have to uh, bail out of that um, that demo, and you probably know why if you look at that picture, uh, and that is because with uh, um, Router OS Wireless, uh, the virtual APs and the virtual uh, interfaces can't be running unless the master is running, uh, and at the moment I don't have the uh, the the client wireless client associated with any uh, access point with any wireless network. And so my uh, virtual AP can't work either. I wonder if one day uh, Router OS will uh, will allow virtual interfaces. Where are those guys? They're hiding. <laughs> oh, hang on. There we go. This is my. But now I've. No, that should be okay. No, it's uh, right. I might just have an, one more shot. So obviously the Windows has decided to uh, keep stay there long enough to get the first page. <coughs> I'm kind of used to this happening now, but of course the very first time it happened, it was driving me nuts. Uh, trying to figure out what was going wrong and what I was doing wrong. I thought it was something with the, the Wubum, but in fact it, it's not. Uh, so you saw the configuration page of Wubum there. I'm, I'm going to try and quickly jump to the, uh, the, sh the terminal. There it is. And that terminal, if it stays connected long enough, will have the router OS shell in it. So what, what you see in that window is pretty much the same as you see in new terminal when you click inside Winbox, uh, or in, uh, in the new terminal in WebFig. It's probably more like the WebFig version because this is a web browser. Uh, it's not going to play nice with me. Um, I apologise for that. Look, I, um, next time if I run this presentation, I will definitely apply that Windows patch so that I can really show it. The patch, uh, I have it filed away in my email address. I'll send it to you. If you send me an email, you, you got my email address, I know you do, uh, and ask me about it and I'll, I'll reply. Um, because I, I search, my Google foo is nowhere near as, uh, as good as the younger folk. Um, he found it pretty much straight away. Uh, it's called something like uh, Microsoft Wireless Assistant or something like that. Uh, and apparently you, there's a registry hack that you can turn it off and there's also something else you can do to to disable it or control it for, for specific uh, uh, networks. Uh, it's not exposed in the Windows GUI, of course, and of course it isn't. Windows don't do that these days. The small end of town. Uh, what I can show you, however, is a picture of uh, one very good reason to uh, have Wubum in your pack. And that is this one. So you see right up the top there is a, an antenna and a halfway along is a, there'll be an omni tick there somewhere. Uh, and uh, there's, look, let's see, there's uh, one large cross piece with a floodlight on it and right underneath it is a box, uh, like an electrical box. Inside that electrical box is a switch uh, that uh, essentially connects each of those uh, uh, microtech back devices, which are various backhaul and uh, and hotspot and so forth. Uh, and can you see Aiden standing right down the bottom there? He's right down the bottom. Uh, he's uh, about as tall. Uh, he's actually shorter than the Geelong bollard uh, next to him. Uh, and Aiden's not short. A Aiden's a, a sizable fellow. Uh, so um, uh, one day uh, we had to go down there and do some maintenance on that thing halfway up because the uh, backhaul uh, stopped working. Uh, and of course once a backhaul stops working, uh, the only way to get up there to figure out what's going on is to plug into that switch. 
uh, and uh, and reboot it or figure out what's going on. Uh, Michael and I went down there one day to do that, and there was a guy there with a, a floppy sort of lift jack thing that sort of wobbles around in the wind. Uh, and I said, uh, yeah, just take this up there, will you boys, and stick it in that Omni tick. Uh, so I saved myself a trip on the on the lift. Some people might, uh, you know, give up their lunchtime to do that sort of thing, but not me. Everything Microtech. Uh, look, uh, I've, I've talked a bit about these uh, three small end of town devices. Um, uh, because I think they're good, and because I'd really like to uh, give you guys a chance to uh, try one for yourself, uh, at uh, lunch break, uh, we've got a few of these to uh, to sell. I've, I've put a decent discount on it so that I'm not just profiteering here. Uh, but uh, look, if you'd like to give it a try, uh, be quick. I've only got about a dozen of each. Um, I, I, I may well be taking them all home, but uh, if, you, uh, if you'd like to give them a go, uh, by all means do so. Uh, meet us out there afterwards and uh, keep us in mind if you need Microtech stuff. Uh, thanks for listening. Any questions? As a, oh, in the the router OS, yeah. I don't know. Do you know that pause? Uh, the Wubum, does it show up in router OS as a as a serial port? Um, no, it's an SSH. Oh, it's an SSH. Yeah. Okay, so it's it's like s it, yeah. It, according to the documentation, some kind of uh, of terminal emulator over the USB. Um, yeah, so it'll be. Yeah, SSH, okay. Thanks, James. Yes? Oh, you mean the uh, the DSL ones? Um, oh, a long story. How long have we got? Uh, it, it's a compliance issue. It's a compliance issue. The, the short story is that the compliance that we've got for it makes it compliant to the usual uh, RF uh, emissions uh, and the electrical safety and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but with equipment that's got to connect to a public network, there is further compliance uh, and the standards are called something like connecting to a public access network or something like that. Uh, and that, that one uh, requires testing by an Australian lab only uh, and it requires uh, configuring the device in s certain ways to run the tests. Now, because they have no user interface, the only way to get them to run in those modes is for the manufacturer to provide us with a special flash and the manufacturers don't want to provide us with a special flash unless we buy, uh, I think it's 100,000 units or something like that. And I'd like to buy 100,000 units, but only if I can be sure that they're going to be compliant. Uh, so there's a bit of a stalemate there. But look, if anyone's interested in some volumes in those, we can certainly work with you guys to, to get that happening. But in the meantime, they are available if you want some ask us, but they are only allowed to be used on your own network. So if you've got your own DSLAM and your own copper infrastructure and so forth, then sure, you can use them for that. Uh, but you can't use them on uh, public e networks at the moment. I didn't hear that. No, 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 I didn't hear it. <laughs> Rob, I didn't hear it. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Enjoy the day.